building and sustaining the excellence of a college requires bringing in and keeping in the brightest young faculty. And that's why we were so thrilled when Andy Cohen approached Mohammed Zaman about coming into UHC. Nevertheless, um, I have a slight beef with Mohammed. I was looking at the program on the way over and I noticed that though I've been a professor for about 30 years and Mohammed's been a professor for how long? Yeah, okay. His title is about twice as long as mine. <laughs> so I'm having what Freud in an unpublished paper called Title Envy. <laughs> it's, it's lucky I'm so secure in other ways. Sorry, as my wife, my wife will tell you, I haven't been able to talk for about a week. It's probably been the best year of our marriage as far as she's concerned. <laughs> anyway, I have to admit that Muhammad really more than merits both his titles and his plaudits. He is doing amazing work in a number of different um, areas, and we are really lucky to have him teaching in the sophomore course. The work he'll talk about today consistent part of trying to bring the best of Western technology and medicine to the developing world. I think Gandhi would have approved. I think we will too. His topic is engineering global development, Mohammed Zaman. Thank you, Charles. Um, no comment on uh, <laughs> that point. Um, we live in a in a very difficult world. There's a world outside Boston, there's a world outside the US, there's a world out there that does not have even the basic necessities that we take for granted. This on the top right of your screen is the state of the art drug screening laboratory in Kenya. You see some sort of old uh, boxes, a few things here and there, and this is where they decide whether the drug should go into the market, whether a particular brand of bread is safe or not. It's not all about engineering, and it's all not about chemistry. It's also about the message, understanding what are your challenges, what are the issues that you're dealing with. So my question to you and to me is, what is the job for an engineer? In solving these crises, what is something that we can do? And what are some of the challenges that we see in the world? This, uh, this map of the world is a couple of years old from the World Health Organization, um, and it's not a very happy map. This is a map of the probability, the chances that someone will have to have a fifth birthday. And the chances are pretty bad in most of Africa, parts of South Asia, Papua New Guinea, parts of Latin America. In parts of the world, 200 or more than 200 babies never make it to the fifth birthday. Pretty bad. Most of these disease, diseases come from pneumonia. Now here's another map about something that is common between all of us. Every single one in this room shares that, and that's the cell phone. This is the world cell phone usage map. Every single one of us either has a cell phone or has access to a cell phone. Now these two things seem completely unrelated, and probably they are. Then you go to another thing that is also unrelated. For those of you who haven't taken my class, you'll see a whole bunch of things that are just completely unrelated. Uh, and we'll try to tie them together. Here's something that is coming a lot in the news these days, Millennium Development Goals, a goal that we are setting at the United Nations for all of us, every single country, a country where I was born, a country where I live now, a country where I work, a country where I'll probably work next year, Asia, Africa, United States. And these are goals that we want to achieve in the next three years. We set them about 10, 12 years ago, but in the next three years, we want to achieve all of these. And the, these are things, all of these things we take for granted, every single one of them, in this country, in this room, in this, in this university. But these are challenges that most of the world is not going to be able to make it, most of the world, okay? Whether it is decreasing child mortality rate, 
whether it is promoting gender equity and equality, achieving universal primary education, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, combat HIV, malaria, and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability, and develop a global partnership for development. Now let's go back for a second. Three things I told you. The first thing was really, really bad statistics on child mortality, most of it coming from pneumonia. Something else, a cell phone, and the usage of the cell phone across the planet. And then the goal, the challenge, the ambition that we want to have for all of us, every single person living in every single country in the world. What engineers do and what my students did, more so than I did, all of this work was done by my students, I just got out of their way, uh, was to combine these three things together in solving a challenge. And what we did was we developed an oximeter. Now some of you know what an oximeter is, some of you don't, so I'll tell you. An oximeter is this little device, if you go for a regular checkup, whether you are one year old or whatever. Um, but, but you go and you get your sort of little finger into this little thing, and in about 20, 25 seconds, you get two numbers. You get how fast your blood is pumping, your, your um, saturation rate, oxygen saturation rate, and your pulse. These two simple, simple metrics are your first line of defense against pneumonia, right? The kids who are presenting signs for acute respiratory infection, their pulse and their oxygen saturation rate are the first line of defense, okay? Now imagine yourself in a situation in rural Zambia, where I work a lot, where there is no power, very poor literacy, but there is a problem of pneumonia. Well, you have to solve it, right? As engineers, as quantitative thinkers, as thinkers, as, as great students of this university, how do you solve it? So what you do is you think about what is out there. Well, there are two things that are common. One is plenty of sunlight, and the second one is, of course, cell phone. Now, you have to think about if they don't have power, how do they have cell phones? That's another problem altogether. We'll worry about that later. But the fact is that somehow, if we are able to design this system in a society where batteries are remarkably expensive and are going to be stolen anyway, how do you solve this problem, right? So what my students did, and this was about a year and a half ago, they came up with a system where you wear this little thing on your, you can wear it on your, uh, sort of um, across your shoulder, you can put it in your backpack, you can just put it outside, and what it does is it takes old cell phone batteries that people have discarded and it charges them. And people change their cell phones very commonly here, they change their cell phones even more commonly in the developing world. So it charges those batteries. Those batteries go into a device, and that device basically has a simple circuit that can measure oxygen and pulse. A typical oximeter, if you were to go uh, to BMC, would cost on the order of $2,000. This costs on the order of $20. Let's see if it works with my student or not. We, he is our, our uh, sort of test case. And in about 20 seconds, you'll see that this device that does not nearly look as cool as Tom's devices, um, but, but uh, can still do the, the, uh, the job. So you have um, pulse is good, oxygen saturation is good at 98%. Right. This was done entirely and exclusively by my students, people like you, who understood the challenge, who understood the opportunity in cell phones, and who understood what needs to be done. So it addresses the issue in ch childhood mortality, which is coming from pneumonia, access to medical care, and things like that. And it is, it is sort of modular. You can add more things. So we did uh, tests. We t tested the batteries. We were wearing our engineering hats, and we did all the finite element modeling and all of those kinds of things to make sure that if somebody throws it or how robust it is, it is going to work at 100 degree temperature or not, and water and humidity and dust and all of those things. Imagine now if somebody in rural Zambia or rural Ethiopia or Papua New Guinea gets hands on this thing, he or she is able to test up to 7,200 kids by charging the battery only once. And we are testing it now. But that's not all engineering. You have to really think about the impact, the society that you are impacting as students as my students, we ask questions about what is engineering and what is reverse engineering. If somebody's already made it, who owns it? Who should own it? How do you address the IP issues? How do you address the copyright issues? Issues associated with economic realities. 
in a society where people barely have enough to eat and make a dollar a day, can they afford a $20 device? Can they? What happens then? Who buys them? Who maintains them? If the society is illiterate, if something goes wrong with the instrument, who fixes them? Then if there is a donor and an acceptor, what is the relationship between them? And then, of course, we have other issues which are very important and important for students to understand. Just because you can diagnose pneumonia doesn't mean you can treat pneumonia as well. So if you don't have any treatment mechanisms, should you tell someone that they have pneumonia? How do you fix that? These are complex challenges which are far beyond the engineering realities. I'm not saying that engineering is not important. It's fundamental to addressing these challenges. We have to do that, but we also have to take the long-range view here and understand the public policy aspects, the economic aspects, the sociological aspects, the sociocultural aspects. And then we have to worry about how do you stay in business? If I make these and make a company out of it, how do I get the next generation of these? Version 2.0 or version 5 or version 10. And these are things that are important for engineers to work in the real world, but they're also equally important for my sociology students, for my students in economics, in religion, in culture, in international relations. And the way we do that is we have created a system, an online system we call LEAD, Laboratory for Engineering Education and Development, where we ask people to comment on these things. It's completely open source. So I get comments all the way from, from Colombo to uh, Colombia, or from Peru to Pakistan, or from Kuala Lumpur to Karachi. Everybody can participate. Give me his or her input. How do you solve these challenges? How do you address them? What is the problem that he or she is facing in the society. I get 20 to 30 emails just about this every day. Somebody saying, well, I think this is a pretty good idea. You should try this or that. And then we, we, we try to address those concerns, not only about an oximeter, about other devices as well. So what I want you guys to do, and I hope I'll be able to convey this in my, in my class when I teach in sophomore level, is that these are system level problems. These are challenges that require engineering to solve, but engineering alone isn't enough. These are problems at the global level. And as citizens of this globe, and as conscientious citizens of this globe, we have the responsibility to solve them. But we can only solve it if we work together. Thank you very much.